Hi guys, it's Dr. Berlin from InformedPregnancy.com. What if I told you there's a swaddle so easy that even dads can do it? But that's not all. The Ollie Swaddle has a patented moisture wicking material that helps reduce the risk of overheating. Its brilliant, innovative design allows for easy access diaper changes without waking your sleeping baby. Visit theolliworld.com and check out all the incredible features that make the Ollie the premium must-have swaddle. That's the O-L-L-I-E world.com. Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast, where our mission is to empower you to make informed choices pertaining to pregnancy, childbirth, and parenting. I'm Dr. Elliot Berlin. I'm a prenatal chiropractor, childbirth educator, and labor doula, living and practicing in Los Angeles, California. Today's topic is Breach Babies 101, where we'll be discussing the most frequently asked questions about breach, from the various types of breach, possible causes of breach, natural and medical remedies, and options for delivery, if the baby doesn't settle head down. This podcast is not meant to administer medical advice, rather, we're just discussing and presenting facts and general experience based options. Every individual case requires individual evaluation and analysis, and we ask that you consult your prenatal care providers and make an informed choice together. In the studio right now, we have a distinguished and highly sought after team of prenatal care providers who each have experience with breech pregnancy and birth that is rare to find today. Let's start with Dr. Barry Brock, originally from Montreal, Canada. Dr. Brock is an award-winning OBGYN who completed his residency at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles in 1981, where he currently practices obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Brock is one of the few remaining obstetricians who offers patients the option for vaginal breech birth in a hospital setting if they meet the safety criteria. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Beth Cannon is a midwife licensed by the California Medical Board. She lives in Los Angeles and catches babies Born at home in L.A. and the surrounding areas during and after her training at the National Midwifery Institute, Beth has studied with some of the modern-day pioneers of midwifery and birth professionals from around the globe and has made it a point to learn the disappearing art, science, and skills of vaginal breech birth and has attended many such births. Beth is an advocate for women's rights to inform birth options and informed choice. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Dr. Milo Shavira. Dr. Shavira completed his OBGYN residency at Los Angeles County USC Medical Center in Los Angeles, where he continued to complete his fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, or high-risk pregnancy. His passion is caring for women with complex medical problems in pregnancy, especially those who thought they could never have a baby or who have been told that it's too dangerous to do so. In addition to his high-risk work, he also supports natural birth and breastfeeding for women and babies in general. He believes that the medical interventions, which can be miraculous and life-saving in some cases, should be reserved for those limited circumstances in which they are truly necessary. Dr. Shivira has training and experience with vaginal breech birth as well. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Susan Minnick has been a certified nurse midwife working in women's health for 35 years. Susan has attended the University of Pennsylvania graduate nurse midwifery program and received her master's of science in nursing and midwifery in 1981. She had a full-time hospital-based nurse midwifery practice for many years before Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles recruited her to come and work there. After a medical trip to China in 1998, during which Susan was fascinated by the success of traditional Chinese medicine, she returned to Los Angeles and completed her master's of science degree in oriental medicine and then received advanced training at the prestigious Institute of Training at the Beijing International Acupuncture Training Center, which is held in very high regard by the World Health Organization. In addition to her midwifery work at Kaiser Permanente and her private acupuncture practice, Susan is a noted author, lecturer, and teacher, and is involved in training both midwives and medical students. Welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to talk about panic 
that takes place about breech babies. Uh, 1974, when I was born vaginally, I was breech, and from what I'm told, uh, nobody either knew or cared that I was breech until midway through the delivery. Today, the option for natural breech birth seems to have all but disappeared in many regions. And as a result, there's this intense pressure on women who'd like a vaginal birth to ensure that their baby is head down, but oftentimes they're not told that the baby's breech until 36 weeks or sometimes even later. And that leaves them in a bit of a shock or a panic and with very little time to research their options or make informed choices. My purpose in today's podcast is to discuss some of the most common questions that they would have, raise general awareness about breach and the options and choices that need to be considered, but also specifically to help those expecting parents who are in that panicky search for information for their current breach babies. So um, I'd love to start by just talking about what is breach and when should we ideally be looking for it? Dr. Barry, why don't you well, jump right in? Since the criteria I need is usually I really want to know by 36 weeks gestation. Because if I want to turn the baby, I want to turn it 37 weeks. And I usually have the, then I see the patients weekly and it has to book it. And I do that, turning the baby in the hospital, external pedalic version. Uh, so I really want to know by 36 weeks. Um, it's a simple thing in the office. Um, if any concerns, I have an ultrasound, I pull it up and make sure the baby's not um, a breach. What is breach specifically? What does it mean? How do you well, define breach? Breach is when the head is not coming down. It's basically other parts, either going to be the feet or the knees or the buttocks. It's coming down into the pelvis. And different types of breach, and they define those differently. But the point is that basically the infant is in longitude live, means going up and down not sideways, but it's not the head, it's the other parts coming down. Okay. The major concern is if it's a footling breach, we have concerns because uh, there's a lot of space there. And if she starts dilating, there's a very big risk if she breaks her water that she can, cord can come out through that breach. But thankfully, if the breach is most of the time, the buttock is down and it's kind of blocks the passageway and prevents the cord coming in. So if you would say if the head is down or the buttocks are down, then they, they're they big enough to block the cord from coming out first. And you can avoid that one concern. If the cord comes out first, the the danger being that if the cord comes out and then the baby comes out, the cord sort of gets stuck between the mother and the baby? Yeah, it pinches and the baby loses blood supply. That's the only source of oxygen. And that's, a, um, then you, at home, you really can't do anything. You don't have much time. You have minutes to get the baby out. So, but most of the time, if you have someone, you'll know beforehand. Um, and usually um, a footing breach is a lot of times, um, it can be multiple patient more than not the first pregnancy. But you should know this by 36 weeks, and that's why I really want to know if the baby's going to be breech. So 36 weeks is your comfort zone. That's when you would check to make sure the baby's head down and clear for takeoff. Are you guys also at 36? Is that your comfort zone? Definitely. I think around 30, I mean, if I'm unsure at that point, I will send somebody in for an ultrasound to confirm what I'm feeling. Uh, we do a lot of hands-on palpation in our appointments, and so... Unless the gal is really fluffy, it's pretty easy to tell what's presenting down at the bottom. But sometimes you just can't know. And in those cases, definitely confirming with ultrasound is the way to, to find out. And again, at that time, there's still enough space to and room to turn the baby if you wanted to try a version. So Beth, you... you deliver babies at home. But I think uh, a question that I also get a lot is what is a midwife and how do they differ from a doula? There's also within midwifery several different types of midwife because um, Susan's here as well and, and you guys have very different practices. So maybe you could just quickly sure. talk about those differences. Uh, I'm a licensed midwife. So my route is I didn't become a nurse first. I, after school went then to midwifery school where I learned by the apprenticeship model. So I had didactic schooling modules that we needed to complete and uh, experience that needed to be completed as well. And so once in California, there's certain schools that are approved by the California Medical Board. And then there's a, the North American Registry of Midwives that they have a test and it's an eight hour exam that you have to pass in order to get certified and become a certified professional midwife. So in California, when you go through specific schooling and complete all of your requirements and then pass the NARM exam, then you can apply to the California Medical Board. So licensed midwives are licensed by 
the California Medical Board, which licenses doctors and nurse midwives go through their programs and they are regulated by the nursing board. Okay, that's great. And we'll talk to Susan about that in just a second. So you are the primary care provider throughout the entire pregnancy. That's correct. I mean, we have consulting physicians if we have questions or need to run certain things by different providers, Milo and different providers that we work in conjunction with because we don't have, you know, I my office does not have an ultrasound machine. It's mostly due to cost and things like that. But we work with doctors and that's great, you know. But by we, definition, you work with low risk. Low risk women. Pregnancies. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. What just out of curiosity, what are some of the examples of something that would high risk somebody out of your care? Gestational diabetes, you know, somebody that's insulin dependent, somebody that's hypertensive and at risk for preeclampsia, things like that. So we work with women that are generally really healthy and there's been no issues throughout their pregnancy. Do you consider breach high risk? I think that in unskilled hands that it is could be a high risk situation but as a home birth midwife you know we do go through these modules that because sometimes there might be a surprise breach so for me when i was first invited to a breach delivery of course i was said yes because i feel that at some point throughout my career this is going to present to me and of course i want to see it I'm going to see it with my you know, own eyes. Maybe you just will turn at the last minute or um, maybe, or you, maybe you didn't catch it on time. And, okay. you know, like I wanted to know what to do in that. In so case. that's how, for me, that path started unfolding to me. The most dangerous part and most important part of all this, the operator has to know how to do a breach. Delivery. Absolutely. That is by far. Mm-hmm. If you don't have the skill to do it, don't do it. Which is a problem because most we don't teach and the course, skills anymore. Which, so. That's exactly well, the problem. That is the Self-fulfilling problem. Self-fulfilling prophecies. Yes, we're going to ch- get there. Uh, Susan, you, you practice midwifery as well, but um, as Beth mentioned, you're a certified nurse midwife. What is the training there? And you practice in a hospital setting. Yes. So I was a registered nurse before I became a nurse midwife, and I worked in the intensive care nursery, and I also did labor and delivery training and ner- working in labor and delivery, high risk back in Philadelphia. And then I went to school and became a certified nurse midwife and have a master's in nursing and midwifery. And I practice as a certified nurse midwife. So nurse midwives deliver in a hospital, a home birth setting, or in a birth center. We're allowed to practice in those three settings. In the state of California, we're under the nursing board. When I practice in Pennsylvania, I was under the medical board. But Mm -hmm. here in California, we're under the nursing so it varies board. by state. Yes, it varies state by state. My scope of practice is pretty similar to Beth's as far as who we deliver and who we see in our office. Well, here in California, you, there's restrictions on midwifery, but are they the same from the medical board and the nursing board? Meaning at, at home, you can't do before 37 or after 42 weeks? That is a law that just it's came a relatively into play. New law. It's relatively new. So here. prior to that, there it was, they would say 36 weeks, six pounds. Mm-hmm. And then like if you were doing past 42 weeks, Six there would be certain pounds. criteria of biophysical profiles and making sure that everything was all good. But are those same laws, the new no, law, no. does that apply to no, it everybody? Doesn't, no, no, it it's, doesn't apply to, to the certified nurse midwives because we have different scope of practice and different terms of supervision, which is another issue that we don't have to talk about today, but it's the word in the licensing of supervision. But at, where I work at Kaiser, we are under a scope of practice and we can co-manage. We can see high-risk patients and co-manage with the MDs. For instance, I see gestational hypertension patients in labor and do the labor and delivery management and the MDs would manage any medications, any problems with the medical side. The same way with diabetics. Milo and I have worked with a few patients who were insulin dependent and the patients really wanted a nurse midwife. And if I was on call that day for delivery, I was very comfortable taking care of the patients. In the Kaiser setting, the the, uh, MDs are right there as well in case. If there's an issue or if there's a problem. Yes. And when I deliver, I deliver without the MDs present in the room. But I teach the residents and the medical students how to deliver babies. So I'm very proud of that, how to look at birth as being normal. Yes. Thank you. And getting away from the fear-based medicine. So that's that's very important to me. And that's been my passion for all these years. Does your facility have a, a policy against breach birth? We do not have a policy against breech birth. However, 
according to ACOG, and the doctors follow this, that if the MD, like Dr. Brock, has experience, they're allowed to deliver breach if they're there or if they want to come in and be on call. And so they don't the have a, they have no no ban on breach delivery. No. They just follow the ACOG guideline that you need to, which is also a practical guideline. You need to have somebody yes. who's, who's skilled. But well, we only but have I, one. It goes beyond that because uh, there uh, are a handful of physicians uh, who were trained in the time when breach delivery was a uh, normal practice. And they have the training and they have the experience and they have the skills. And they have just elected to uh, stop offering the service because it's sort of the prevailing community standard, if you will. You know, nobody else is doing it, so they don't want to be the one doing it. So there are experienced providers who have also elected to uh, discontinue this practice. I'm going to backtrack a little bit because uh, we made a wonderful documentary about this topic, Vaginal Breach Birth, called Heads Up. Uh, the Disappearing Art of Vaginal Breach Delivery, which can be found at headsupfilm.com. But I really want to talk about all the things before that. Uh, the original question is, when would you really check for breach? 35 or 36 weeks seems to uh, to be a common number. Um, as a chiropractor, uh, we like to see what's going on at 32 weeks. And I think at 32 weeks, you probably still have about a 10% uh, breach rate. And at birth, you only have a 3 or 4% breach rate. So that means more than half. If you go from 10 out of 100 to only 3 or 4 out of 100, more than half of those babies are going to turn. But when we start doing the natural techniques, which we'll uh, get into shortly, uh, we get about, uh, at 32 weeks, we have about 90% of our babies turn. So what I tell patients at 32 weeks is not time to panic yet, but it's certainly like a little pink flag. Hey, if my baby continues to stay breached, what are the kind of things that I can do to uh, encourage this baby to get head down? Or what kind of options will I have if the baby doesn't get head down? It gives them a lot more time to really research options, find providers or practitioners, and, and not have such panic in, in order to make an informed choice. Yeah, so for you to be able to, if you're going to see them at 32 weeks anyway, just give them the heads up, no pun intended, that <laughs> the baby's heads up, then um, you just open a world of options for them. They're not going to leave you as a practitioner, but there are things that they can, even positional things like they can do at home. For example, from spinningbabies.com, they have a whole bunch of positional exercises that help stretch the uh, ligaments and, and sort of use gravity to bring the baby um, out uh, naturally or or uh, just using ice or peppermint oil, things like that, that are natural. Um, if they find out at 32 or 33 weeks, they have a lot more reaction time than 35 or 36 weeks. And from a Chinese medicine point of view, 32, 33, 34 weeks is ideal for us to do our acupuncture at our, and our moxibustion. And that is really an important time for us to start that. And all the studies show that the babies do have a higher chance of turning at 34 weeks, between 34 and 36 weeks. Yeah, and I think if we did the ECV, then they'd have a higher yeah. chance of turning too, but there's a, there's a, you know, a risk that we, we're not comfortable taking at, at that early that doesn't really exist with acupuncture, moxibustion, right. massage, chiropractic, and, chiropr the, and some yes. of the other natural things mm -hmm. that we can talk about in just a moment. Yes. Um, but uh, it's not even just that they have a higher chance, it's if you compare the natural chance versus the doing something chance is significantly higher. So um, yes. to me, I think most people are upset when they find out at 36 weeks for the first time that they could have been doing something three or four weeks ago. Exactly. And I would be. I, yes. Yeah, I would want to mm -hmm. know earlier. So I started this Facebook campaign a while ago, check for breach at 32 weeks, but... Well, I think in the Facebook. office, I know when I see patients, I'm sure, Beth, you do, and both of you, I use my hands. I do not do ultrasounds. I believe in using our hands to feel the baby, to do presentation, feel presentation. I have the moms and the dads feel the baby. And a lot of times the babies are breached, and we talk about different options, and they like knowing what position the baby's in. They come and say, well, where's my baby's head? And mm -hmm, I don't scare them either. It's like, okay, so, you know, you're 32, 33 weeks. Let's, here's what we can do. You know, we do... I'd like to see it 36 weeks, yeah. But I'm yeah. saying I use the ultrasound at 36 weeks if I'm not 100% sure right. the baby's... Yeah. Well, that makes sense. But if you found that uh, just by palpation at 32 or 33 weeks, would you let them know about it? Yes, or? they okay. know. Okay, great. What are some of the causes of breech baby? There are some uh, recognized causes. Uh, uh, placental location can be one. And probably what that does, it just kind of alters the shape of the uterine cavity and maybe makes it harder for the baby to find its way around. I think is it the, a specific location that gets more of an issue? 
Yeah, so there are two. One would be if you have a placenta previa, of course, in that circumstance, uh, you're you're not going to be thinking about a vaginal birth and you're going to be thinking about a cesarean delivery. But the placenta the, previa where the placenta the, is sitting on top of the cervix so in order to get correct, out, the baby has to sort of crush through the placenta. Sort of blocking the exit door, if you will. Right. So in general, that that's not considered a, a safe delivery option compared to cesarean. Right. Uh, but the other location, if it's, if it's up high in the uterus in one of the corners, that's actually one of the most frequent uh, placenta locations for um, uh, when babies are breached. So that's one reason. Uh, another reason might be uh, fibroids, which are these uh, you know muscular tumors that form in the uterus. They're very common. Actually, the majority of women have them, but they tend to be very small. Uh, some women will have larger fibroids or multiple fibroids. And again, this sort of alters the shape of the uterus and maybe just makes it harder for the baby to find its way around and, and, and get the head down into the pelvis. So fibroids can be a reason. The fibroids is one. The other one is what's called a, um, a mouth-shaped uterus, a bicornuid uterus, things like that. And those babies, not only are they in breech position, it's very difficult to flip them. For the textbook, I mean, the causes are, u- are uterine, maternal side, and fetal side. There can be problems with the babies, but thank God it's a rare occurrence, but it can be problems with the babies. What kind of problems? Well, not today, we find out, but you can have a baby that um, is malformed head, mm-hmm. kind of missing the part of the head and the scalp. I mean, we'd already know that on ultrasound yes, today. So. But that's the cause of it, you know, but it's, right. we'd find that. Um, Babies sometimes are not moving properly, have neurological problems, but most of the things are very rare. So most common cause of a breech baby is, we don't know. Right. So <laughs> normally, there. normally these are associations. When a baby's breech, you would not assume there's something wrong with the baby, quote unquote. Correct. And when a baby's in, in frank breech position, so pike, they're not kicking. So in that same way, whereas a... a, yeah, a where you get the motion at right, the joints. So it's harder for them to turn. If you put your feet by your head, I'm going to see you kick for short, a little while. Uh, short umbilical cord? Um, I don't know. I, I once suspect, in a while? Not sure, but maybe multiple times around the neck. Wrapped around the neck. Wrapped the neck. Around the neck and which is that. not the dangerous? No. It's very... Well, in there's the nothing you can do about it. A cord around the neck is very, very common. It's and a very small percentage will get into trouble. Very small. But you can't predict. And people ask you to scan to make sure the cord is around the neck. That's irrelevant. We find a lot of information and we make assumptions. And it turns out in medicine, most of the time, we're wrong. Different types of breach. Beth mentioned frank breach, where the baby's butt is down, blocking the canal. So at least you don't have the uh, umbilical cord prolapse issue. And the legs are up by up the by their, face, their like face. they're doing a pike dive. Uh, what are some of the other types of breach? There's complete breach, which is they're in the Indian style kind of classic position that oh, that's when you criss-cross see, crisscross applesauce, yeah, crisscross <laughs> applesauce, and I've, Which in my experience, anyway. of sending people for versions, those babies are more apt to turn from a version. The uh, complete complete breach. breach. Where, okay, so this is I, I sort so of describe like, it because we did the pike dive, right? Sort of describe the cannonball is that uh-huh. almost. Right, so the baby's still butt down. Still butt down. But instead of the legs being extended up towards the head, the knees are bent. N- knees are bent, just like how you picture a head down baby with their knees bent, bent and curled around the fetal position. position. Yeah. So the worst reverse criteria fetal. you have for turning baby, if the butt or whatever is deep in the pelvis, deep. That's forget it. The chances for of either one of those two. And uh, Frank the butt, or if something goes really deep in the pelvis, because you have to get the presenting Moving part out. out of the pelvis, yeah. and if it's stuck in the pelvis deep. Nothing's turning. It's nothing's going to turn. <laughs> so you you were just saying, Beth, that out of those two positions, you feel like the complete breach have an easier time moving around. Is that you feel the same? For a version, yeah. that's a version. what I've seen. I that think is that true. as far as getting the yeah. torque. There's studies that show that also. Oh, okay, well then. It's yeah. a torque then thing. It must be true. And, and I read it on right. Google. So the things that make, totally true. The <laughs> things that make it more successful, the common sense. If you have an, enough amniotic fluid... The, the presenting part is now. If she's a multip. If you're a multip, that really helps a lot. <laughs> multip means you've already, had, already had, had a baby. baby. And, so it's um, more, if let, you, the tone is not and, as tight as a primate. Right. Yeah, and which is not an insult. Unfortunately, no. what is actually makes worse, if the, if, if the mother is a phenomenal abdominal muscles and just rock hard, yeah. it is really tough. I find in the office tough. runners, dancers, gymnasts. Pilates. Um, I would definitely not have a problem turning my breech baby. I don't do any of those things. <laughs> but fortunately, I have other problems with uh, carrying a baby. It'd be <laughs> floppy like me and have a lot of... Yeah, we would be fine. Fine, yeah. I'm we should have sure babies, about. Dr. Barry. <laughs> 
Um, so we had the Frank breach, uh, we had the complete breach, and then there's footling breach, footling which is breach. either one foot or both down against the cervix. Footling would be nice because you have plenty of room. It's just, yeah. you know, it's not super deep. <laughs> yeah. It's not super deep. Super, well, and the, well, I'm the saying that foot smaller. can get really Small, down under smaller. there. It's, it's not a smaller like a, thing to get out yes. than a butt, than a wedged in butt. And besides, the feet down there, it's not wedging in there. Because no matter by definition, because the feet are not that big, so it's easy to, much easier to turn the baby. And then what's transverse? Transverse is the baby's going sideways. In other words, from not not across from head to foot, and mother's head to foot, it goes the other way. But that's very unusual unless you have um, fibroids, mal-shaped uterus, or she's had several babies before. Uh, first time mothers rarely have a transverse unless they have fibroids or malshirt uterus. Several babies before because now it's you just very stretch stretched out. out. You really stretched so, out, and the baby can be comfortable lying sideways. Hammock, hammock yeah. style. Mm-hmm. Okay, Susan, when you when when they because I know you work a lot with breech, breech babies at Kaiser, leading up to and in your private practice. Yes, um, are you present at the external version? Yes, and because that's my day to deliver babies. On Tuesday, on Tuesdays, so I'm, when so you guys I'm do that. so happy that I can go there and hang out with my patients when they do the versions. And we have wonderful physicians at Kaiser who have lots of experience doing the external versions. Yeah. Yesterday, we had a great patient of mine who it was it's her second baby, and on the third try, the baby flipped. I just happened to run flying in because I promised her I'd be there, but I was delivering a baby. Our other patient who was a version that turned, and I delivered her. I walked in and the doctor said, I'll do it one more time since Susan's here. And the patient was doing moxa the day before for a week with me in acupuncture. That baby flipped. Awesome. So we yeah. were very happy. Yesterday, the we doctor... Need little, we, had, yes. we need little Susan dolls, like little Buddha, Buddha well, yes. things to put on but the poker chips. I was really happy for them. Yeah. And then I saw her today and she's still head down. And she's doing great. Her baby's due in three weeks. We did it at 36 weeks. But we started doing the moxa bus. Is that common at Kaiser? 36 weeks? To do the external version, yes. yes. We like to do it at 36 weeks because the baby's smaller and they feel that they have a better chance of the baby averting. We when, should do it at 37 weeks. Um, I did one today and third time around, it flipped. On your vacation? Yeah. yeah. You really have to know the technique. Has, you do a version. It yes. has nothing to do with the upper part. It's all in the pelvis. You have to push the yes. butt out of the pelvis and then let rotate around. Then it'll move, but... You don't move from the top. You have to get the space. I'm going to go from least invasive to most invasive and talk about some of the things naturally that um, that that are done to help breech babies. I just want to follow up about your uh, <clears throat> your question about transverse because I think there's there's something that is distinctly different about the transverse baby and the breech baby because the shape of the uterus is different. So. The breech baby, because the uterus develops this sort of longitudinal shape, so it's it's kind of long in the direction of the mom's you know head and feet, that sort of axis. If you successfully get the baby to flip over head down, it's very likely going to stay in that position, and you can just let the mom go and wait for her to to go into labor. But the transverse is very different because the uterus develops this this kind of side to side shape, and it makes it very easy for the baby to uh, you know change positions. And 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 in fact, there's this term you'll hear once in a while. People will say this baby has an unstable lie, which means every time they come to the office, the baby's in a different place. The head's on the left, the head's on the right, the baby's head down, the baby's breech, and probably what you got there is you really have a transverse lie and the uterus is kind of stretched out sideways and this baby is free to flip around, to, to flip around. back and forth. Those versions are actually very easy to do. The they baby is stay. very easy to manipulate and you can get that baby head down. It's just not gonna stay. Right. And so I personally have gotten into the habit of uh, doing those differently. I'll actually wait till 39 weeks and then get the baby head down and induce. I would do the same thing. The only, only thing I would add to it, I would try the old trick of abdominal binder after mm-hmm. I turn. But like I say, if it doesn't work, I say, okay, we're going to repeat it again in 39 weeks and I'm going to induce you. And we had a patient on, at Kaiser on Monday that was breech. She came in on Tuesday, verted. They induced her 
and then that was I was telling you I delivered her. her. Third that baby. was her third baby, yeah. and we were worried about unstable, you know, unstable. unstable so we did a nice induction, and she had a beautiful birth yesterday, and I was there to deliver the baby, and wow. it was it was but great. I have one of those yeah. infamous ones years ago when I was in Montreal when I was a medical student. Back then, they didn't have ultrasound. I'm a little older than you guys. <laughs> and uh, so they sent the mother, they weren't sure the physician, for an x-ray on a different floor. She goes to a different floor, not portable, <laughs> comes back with the x-ray in her hand, showing a breech baby, and proceeds to deliver vaginally a vertex. <laughs> she well, flipped in the elevator. Oh, that's great. Just spinning, on the way spinning. down. Talk about spinning babies. <laughs> All right, we're going to bring in uh, one of the moms that has a question here. Yeah, my name is Fabiola. I'm a first-time mom, 35 years old. And um, my question is, how do you know if you have a misshapen uterus? Um, if they do the ultrasound, why aren't you told if you do have one? Um, and basically, my concern is that I think I have um, more of a transverse than breach because I feel the head's always like towards the right side. Occasionally at night, I wake up and I'll feel the head up. Um, below my sternum, but then most of the day I feel them again on the right. Transverse is a little different. You probably have just a breach, but it goes from side to side, trying to turn them. There's a little room up there to move. Um, to figure out if you have a mouse-shaped uterus, remember it's probably not, but they only, you can't really tell now. Um, but in the first trimester, sometimes they can see it on the ultrasound, what it looks like. Or if there's other tests to do if you're not pregnant. There's no reason to do those tests. Um, it's just a curiosity. You're not going to do anything different. I wouldn't recommend surgery to fix it or anything like that. It's just a curiosity. It really doesn't... I'm, I'm extremely pragmatic. So to my mind, it doesn't really make a difference. Whatever it is, it is. If you try the version, if it's not successful, it's not successful. It is, it is. It doesn't make a difference. You have malformed uterus or not the baby's still enjoying itself in there i would say that uh just to expand upon what what dr brock said um i find all the time that babies that are in one of the buttocks down breech positions whether it's a uh, frank breech with the legs up or complete breech with the legs down that the head which is up underneath your rib cage someplace will move back and forth from the right angle of the rib to the left angle of the rib kind of like three o'clock to nine o'clock if this was a big clock in here mm -hmm. but then not get past there do you feel like your baby comes low down or do you feel like your baby's ever all the way straight across with the head over on the left side and the butt on the right side or vice versa? Well, initially, the with the ultrasound, which is when I found out about the positioning, um, the baby's head was always on the right and the spine curved across my belly, which just, they I was told that the butt, buttocks was just diagonally across mm -hmm. from that and that the knees and toes were down here. Right. Um, I did bring up the topic that I never felt any type of movement in this upper left-hand part. And Do you know where your placenta is attached? Well, that's what I suspected. Yeah. Um, but I was just told, no, it's just, don't worry about Did it. Did they tell you where it's attached? <laughs> no. So you don't know. It might Because if your placenta is right there, you're not going to feel very much. Yeah, that's just what I, I mean, that's what I put together in my head. If I don't feel anything there, maybe that's where my placenta is at. Possible. How many weeks are you? I'm going to be 37 this weekend. Obstetric training these days is completely different than what it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, you know, training in operative vaginal delivery is disappearing. Training yes. in breech vaginal delivery is disappearing. Training in manual rotations is disappearing. I mean, these were things during my training I was never taught to do. I was never taught to do a manual rotation. I was never taught to do forceps. I never witnessed a breech vaginal delivery. I'm going to clarify manual rotation, which sounds a lot like the external version, but yeah. it's not. So this is where the baby's head down, but is in a kind of face up position where the, the, the baby's face is, is facing towards mom's belly belly instead of towards her back. So the back of the skull is against the spine. Sunny side up. Yeah. Sunny, sunny side up. Yeah. So uh, it's it's uh, usually a lot difficult, a lot more difficult for the baby to get through the pelvis in that position. And and sometimes uh, you can kind of help rotate the baby around. Into, Internally or externally? Internally. Internally. So okay. it's done during labor. You know, all these tools that the obstetrician used to be trained in and the art of obstetrics are uh, largely gone. So their only tool is the cesarean delivery. And, you know, any situation that makes them uncomfortable is solved 
by ending the pregnancy and performing the cesarean delivery. For one more thing about the C-section rate going up, for me as a nurse midwife, what I see, the patients are getting epidurals really early. And I feel that there's not enough TLC with the patients, tender loving care, midwifery care, normal natural things that we can do to help the ladies in labor. And I know this is a whole different topic. But recently, I've been taking my own survey. I've had patients pushing for three, four hours that are OP, transverse, look at the baby's heads looking sideways, and they get stuck. They're deep in the pelvis. I have the ladies hanging, pushing, all kind of different positions, everything we can do. And their baby's heads are getting stuck. And it's just really sad. And what Dr. Chavira said is the manual rotation is disappearing, but Mm -hmm. we're trying to bring it back. And we have a lot of the residents now and the staff that are trying to do these rotations for the baby. Fabriola had a uh, another question and then I want to get back to like what does somebody do like you when you find out at 35 weeks that you have a breach Yeah baby? because my my option was when I first found out was okay let's wait a week and then we monitored me again and then confirmed it again that baby still breached and my option was okay let's schedule your cesarean in two weeks when you become 39 weeks. Um, so I went and did my own uh, research that I could find and I questioned about the whole aversion and the objection to that was well you're a little bit heavier set so it's going to be really hard to do so why even try basically (laughs) um i've gained a total of seven pounds in my pregnancy i I am bigger stature i mean i'm six feet tall i'm over 200 pounds but um you should have tackled them (laughs) 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 but yeah i mean i've been i'm not diabetic fulfilling prophecies exactly so the fact is absolutely try if it Absolutely. fails, it fails. So what? Yeah. So you're back in the same position, you know? Well, let me back up. You find out at 35 weeks that you have a breech baby. You still have at least one week, maybe two weeks before the OBs are comfortable doing the external version. The right? reason I found out at 35 is because because of an ultrasound. Previously, my first one, they said, oh, because of the size of your baby, you're, they thought I was a week more than I was. But I was very, um, my baby was planned. So I knew when I ovulated. I knew when my last menstrual cycle was. And I was actually a week behind in my eyes. Um, so I got that ultrasound early at 35, and that's why they wanted to wait. But I think successful version is one option to do, and I think that's the first thing I would do, you know what I mean, to try to turn mm-hmm. it. Um, then the option is if you want to do a vaginal breech liver or cesarean section. I mean, you can wait to go into labor. You can schedule a cesarean section. You wait to go into labor and decide then. You can wait to labor and try for vaginal breech liver and see how you progress and try to decide then. All right, and we're going to conclude part one of... Breach Babies 101 on the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. Check out the show notes at informedpregnancy.com. And uh, as always, write questions to info at informedpregnancy.com. And the conversation continues with part two of Breach Babies 101.